to the cloud now. Hello, internet. Um, all right, well, welcome everybody to our first virtual beta talks. Um, it's Tuesday, June 23rd. Uh, we are, I'm in New York City. Um, I'm, my name is Kate Nicholson and I direct um, a lot of our beta, and beta NYC civic engagement and partnership, um, partnership programs. And so um, today we're here to talk about what has been going on in the civic tech community around us um, in response to COVID-19. Um, you know, when COVID hit, there was a tremendous sort of uh, organ organization at a community level. And um, I know we took a little bit part of it and other um, organizations that are in our community, um, especially in the Code for America Brigades system, um, were also sort of taking initiative. And um, personally, I think it was really cool to see this new type of organizing take place. Um, so we're really excited to share just three sort of uh, core projects that um, talk about uh, housing eviction data, or sorry, housing evictions, um, and the sort of tenants' rights around that, um, one around mapping essential businesses, and um, one around sidewalk widths. So um, before we get into that, um, welcome. Um, and vote uh, today if you're in New York City is a very important day um, to either send in your ballot, um, your absentee ballot, or to go to your polling station and uh, make sure your voice is heard. Um, some quick just logistics. Um, we're, we're, we're recording this uh, session, so um, camera's off for now um, as presenters are presenting, but during the Q&A, feel free to put on your camera um, and we can have a discussion. Like Noel said, we're sort of engaging in a new format for beta talks um, and meetings and sort of seeing if we like the meetings or the webinars better for um, these sort of more community uh, share back um, events. Um, so we're getting started. Um, we're gonna kick off uh, just with a brief in introduction to Beta NYC and to our presenters today. And then um, we'll just get right into the lightning talks. Um, so Beta NYC is a nonprofit organization based in New York City um, that was established back in 2008 um, and soon became a big player in the um, civic tech community as advocates for open data in New York City. Um, and we have since grown to be an organization that really focuses on um, three core sort of um, offerings, I guess you could say. Um, and those include um, building tech uh, tools uh, and doing data research. So creating uh, data-driven tools for government and the public that help uh, promote civic engagement um, and uh, healthier democracy. Um, and we also run a civic innovation program with CUNY students um, in New York City that um, contributes to the civic tech talent pipeline in New York City. Um, so we're big, uh, we're big, uh, we find it very uh, important to sort of connect all the, all the age groups of people throughout the city um, and make sure that the civic tech community is very robust. And so in that, we also are community organizers and produce events um, like hackathons and conferences that uh, invite people to come and share their work and network and build um, community. So at the core of what we do are these four values, um, the, the freedom to connect, the freedom to learn, and the freedom to innovate, and the freedom to collaborate. Um, and so this is sort of what we maintain as central to our work. Um, and beta talks emerged as um, uh, sort of Beta NYC was running a lot of meetups in New York City, and um, there's just a lot of really great work going on at, in, within the civic tech community. So um, we see Beta Talks as just an evening event series that we can um, provide to others who are doing really awesome work um, as a platform to practice sharing, um, meeting people, and um, talking about issue-based um, work. So um, last year, I don't know if anyone attended, but we did one around bicycle rights, um, and we tend to like to do them around themes. So this one is around the response to COVID. Um, just a quick shout out and thank you to the people that um, support us, especially during this time. Um, uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, um, who is um, actually our home, uh, hosts us in her office, um, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, who um, supports us through funding. Um, so quick introductions, who's in the room? Um, I'm Kate Nicholson, like I said. Uh, Noel is in the room, he's also from Beta NYC, and Z is also um, in the room from Beta NYC. And then our presenters, um, we have Paul Gale and Laura Sewell. 
and um, I might have mispronounced that. Did I mispronounce? So great. Um, from the East Village Community Coalition, um, and they're going to present on what's open East Village, um, a really awesome example of community organizing at a local level to um, help initially um, elderly and immunocompromised folks um, find essential businesses that are open um, specifically with hours for them to go shopping and has since evolved into a citywide project, which is pretty cool. Um, Gregory Johnson um, from Code for South Florida. Um, Gregory is from um, Miami and we connected through the CFA, the Code for America Brigade. Um, and we have been in touch just since uh, March when we participated in a session together and keep, we've been updating each other on what we've been doing. So I'm really excited that we are able to sort of draw these inter or yeah, inter-city connections. Um, and I've learned a lot from Gregory about the work that they're doing down there. So they're really exciting to talk about how they're helping tenants protect, helping protect tenants rights and helping tenants find information about um, the eviction status of their properties. And then last but not least, Nellie Harvey. Um, I don't know if you're from New York City and you're really into open streets, um, which I know a lot of people in our community are, you might be aware of this amazing map um, called Sidewalk Width Map, Sidewalk Width NYC. Um, essentially, uh, you know, when folks were saying stay at home, um, don't go outside, um, and then other folks were advocating for open streets, there weren't a lot of decisions being made. And this is sort of an application of um, using data to say, hey, like, the social distancing rules are actually like not even, it's not even feasible to social distance on New York City sidewalks. We need to have more open streets and why don't you look at this map and sort of say like where you can allocate um, those decisions. So really excited to have Melly here today to tell us all about that. Um, and then last but not least, um, we were looking forward to having a conversation around the city budget in general um, and especially around the recent um, calls to defund the police. Um, and one of the things I think civic tech is really useful for in discussions around the budget is um, helping to create more opportunities for folks to engage with um, the budget, uh, sift through it, create tools for others to explore it, um, and then be more part of the decisions that are made around city budgets. So um, I'll be highlighting just some other research that um, the, Civ the Citizens Budget Commission has already conducted um, and just sort of posing that as a future conversation. So without further ado, um, let's get into it. Um, we will start off with um, what's open, East Village. Hey, hi, as she said before, my name's Paul Gale, uh, and I teamed up with Laura at the EVCC East Village Community Coalition and G to create this site uh, along with a couple of other volunteers. So uh, that's our, this is the name of our site. Uh, feel free to visit it, check it out. This is what it looks like. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see, that's what it's like on the phone. It's like what it's like on the desktop. Uh, there's a little bit more that, to the site that I will discuss. Um, but as you can see, there's a Google Translate thing at the top and uh, buttons for people to submit information and corrections and stuff. So what's open EV is a simple directory and map built using Airtable and Mapbox that uses a combination of manual input and form submissions to maintain the accuracy of the data. A rotating group of about four people, including myself throughout the two months of the site's existence, uh, have been in charge of data input. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it to Laura for the origin story. Next slide, please. Hi, so we found, as I'm sure many of you did, that it became impossible to find accurate information um, when the shutdown order, the pause order happened. Google Maps was frozen in pre-COVID era. Businesses were understaffed and they couldn't answer their phones, even if they were there. And we were just thinking, how are we ever gonna keep track of this? How can we figure out how to go to the laundromat with a bag of clothes and know that the gate isn't gonna be locked when we arrive? And I got a, an email from a lunatic perfectionist named Paul Gale, and the rest is history. So next slide, please. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a crazy thing to try to do something like recreate Google Maps in our small neighborhood overnight. Uh, but we were very, I was very, we, the project was very fortunate to have Laura's uh, data set from her uh, guide. EVCC has a, a local business, small business guide in the East Village. So there was, uh, something, a skeleton to work off of, and there was about maybe 300 relevant businesses, a, a bunch more that still have not opened, like beauty salons, et cetera. 
but um, so we started off with that and EV Grieve, which is like the, the, the most well trafficked thing that is East Village. It's a, it's a blog run by one guy in his spare time, God bless him. Uh, so there was an ad hoc, partially complete, super disorganized list of, of what restaurants mostly, but uh, some other things, including laundromats that readers had reported to him. Um, and then there are a few groups. There was a WhatsApp group and a Facebook group that was like East Village COVID-19 that uh, myself and a couple of other volunteers just sort of went to every single day and, and, and got the latest tips from people. Uh, so the, the back end of the site was uh, Google Sheets for version one. Um, and that was updated at real time. And since June, we've been using Airtable, which pulls one time per hour. Uh, and if anyone is interested in just checking out how we did it or, or uh, recreating it for your own purpose, whether it's your neighborhood or something else, we have templates for the Google Sheet and the Airtable along with the submission form uh, that are linked at the bottom. Feel free to check that out. Uh, so next slide, please. So we built the tool and how do we get the word out? Uh, we were very much like, this was a, a, a what we hoped would be a short term utility. Uh, so we were really uh, not precious with sharing the data. Um, and we, we provided an embed code to Laura's site, of course. There's another, an independent merchants association, which is a consortium of businesses in the East Village and EV Grieve itself. Uh, you know, it didn't matter that there was traffic coming to our site. We wanted it to just be out there. So we gave it to EV Grieve, of course. Uh, the electeds were very supported. They shared it on Facebook and Twitter and their newsletters. And uh, Laura had developed a mailing list of, of the businesses so that we could hope to maintain the integrity and the accuracy of the data by giving them the ability to update themselves. Um, got some traction from local publications. And most excitingly, uh, this ad, which is a video, uh, ran uh, on Link NYC's, which are the kiosks in New York City. Uh, and we got free placement based on the our reaching out to the DOITT, which is the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. It took me like three weeks and three different ways to get a hold of them. But once we did, it was like a 10 day process, which to me was, I was shocked at how lightning fast it was and it was really painless. Next slide, please. So we've been doing data collection since 2006 in the East Village on our guide. And, you know, there's always this dream of asking business owners to self-report, which in a good time, we're thrilled when we get 10%. So I, we knew going in that we were going to have to do this ourselves um, since it certainly wasn't a good time. So we can use Google still for addresses and names, the things that don't have to be updated. Uh, as long as I had them on my database, I knew that they were act, you know, still open. And then Instagram, we have always found to be really up to date. That's where most of our businesses communicate with their patrons uh, about their hours or their specials or whatever they have going on. So that was super helpful. We would call businesses that didn't have um, an online presence or just to get their hours sometimes if their website looked like they hadn't been to it in four years. And when we're, you know, last case scenario, I would go physical survey, um, the block at a time for something, things we knew we needed that didn't take me out of my way while I was doing other errands. Um, then we, and we would take the lat longs from Google Maps. And we didn't, we chose not to list closed businesses. We didn't want to this in any way to injure anyone, uh, only a business, only to empower them. So, so if you saw that it's open on, on the map, then you could go there uh, safely. Next slide. Um, so we had originally thought we would just finished this and couldn't wait to not have to do it anymore. But now that I've got this beautiful tool, I'm not letting it go. Um, and we're finding that like a lot of the businesses are open, but they're open with limited access or reduced hours. So providing this information in one place is still important. It's a significant time commitment. So we're going to dedicate some intern power to that you know, for the foreseeable future. Next, Next, Next slide. slide. So in the interest of being super transparent, uh, a couple of maybe a week or so in, we, we uh, started Google Analytics on the site and 
it's just one page. It's very simple and our bounce rate is super high, I think, because it's just one page. Um, but in, in like trying to give a complete picture of the impact that it had, I think overall it says we have uh, about almost 10,000 users, 9,400. Uh, and it's unclear, you know, if someone is going to visit it once and they may, maybe they find the five places that they like to go to and, and they're visiting that a bunch of times. You know, our, our user base is not only the businesses, but also the community. And it's really about strengthening the community at the end of the day. Uh, and so uh, we expect to see a significant increase with the launch of V2, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but even if the growth were to stop at this point, it would, it would be worth it, not only for the data collection that Laura was just talking about, so that she can help these businesses uh, and the community stay diverse and, and uh, small business. But um, just that, you know, if only if it was only helpful in that moment in time, it's enough for us. Next slide, please. Just a quick time check. Um, you have like one, two more minutes left. Okay, um, all right. A little over time, but we could, we have a second. Okay, sorry. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, translation is something we, we it's important to us. I wanted to touch upon it. Um, we have since the beginning of the site, we've been uh, in, in Chinese simplified and traditional and in Spanish, because uh, those are the second and third most widely spoken uh, first languages in the East Village. Um, I, I guess I, I can skip over past this, but basically the problem is the, the UI, uh, we had it translated perfectly, but a lot of the notes and stuff weren't translated. So we think some combination of Google Translate and uh, manually translating it with translators is the solution. Next slide, please. Uh, to increase our impact on the community, we have a, a spotlight in version two, which is just a short three post blog basically that gets refreshed. Uh, and it allows us to highlight volunteer projects and, and uh, just human interest stories or business interest stories. Uh, and during the Black Lives Matter protest, users expressed interest in supporting black owned businesses in particular. Uh, so we expanded that a little bit and, and made it so that you can view minority and women owned businesses and or black owned businesses and or LGBTQ owned businesses for our users. Um, and to help strengthen those businesses. Next. Uh, we also have something called newest map updates to let users know that the site is being updated, even though it says we update it every day to let them physically know what is going on. So at the very bottom of the site, there's that. Uh, and Laura, I'll have you take care of the last thing. Yeah, thanks. So I, the first thing I always tell our interns is don't, don't, listen, to, don't listen to Google Maps, don't listen to Yelp. There's no substitute for our eyes and ears on the ground and our interaction with the business owners and what we find and data that's maintained by community organizations. And it's absolutely always been the case and it's particularly so now. And I'm really thanks, I can't thank Beta enough for enabling us to do this work. Thank you. Yeah, Xi has been, just to, to finish up, Xi has been really helpful and very on the ball and, and any sort of crazy changes that we've wanted throughout this process. <laughs> and, uh, if you guys don't work with Beta NYC and there's a product that makes sense, I, we truly recommend it. And they didn't tell us to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, feel free to email if you have any questions or, or want to use the tech for your own community. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, great work. Uh, so yeah, check check it out. Um, I'm glad to hear that it's evolving. Uh, and if you have questions, just a reminder, um, I forgot to put the, I'm sorry, social handles there, but um, ask questions in the Q&A. Um, and now we are ready for Gregory. Hey everybody, um, Gregory here um, from Code4 South Florida. Uh, we are also a nonprofit 501c3 and based in uh, three counties here in um, South Florida area. And I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Florida Eviction Project. This is a project that came about from one of our community partners, Community Justice Project, reaching out to us and just having kind of like a big need around the problem, which is a lot of people are out of jobs and due to the pandemic and they can't pay rent. So what do they do about that? So we're gonna share with a little bit about our project and how we went about building a website um, that shared data across all the counties in Florida around eviction protection policy. Can you go to the next slide, please? So before I dive into the project, I wanna kind of touch on the problem. So one of the state government's problems is in Florida, almost 230,000 applicants tried to file on the employment application website system. Um, tried is a big word here because they're unable to 
move forward for various reasons. And as we look at data based on like March 7th to March 14th to 21, you can kind of see the numbers of people trying to get on the unemployment benefits application website. And a lot of them couldn't get through. Can you go to the next slide, please? As we look at data from the New York Times um, in this chart, initial claims since March 15 for the state of Florida, there's a lot of bubbles here I know. Um, basically Florida had about 15 or 16% initial claims. Um, but the amount of people that actually received benefits, if you look at Florida, is we're in dead last with almost about 5% of the people have actually received benefits. And I share the story of like data and the problem to kind of touch on like people are unemployed and they can't even get benefits. How on earth are they going to get money to pay rent, especially if they don't have much in savings and they have a household and many other things. So this is kind of like the user perspective that we use to kind of like highlight and, uh, and understand like this is a big need in Florida and other places. Next slide, please. So the problem we saw was the COVID pandemic led to unexpected employment, um, leaving many people unable to pay rent. And as we kind of did some user research, this was brought about Community Justice Project, our partner. The biggest question is, if I can't pay rent, can my landlord kick me out? Next slide. So here's how we approach this. We saw volunteers in our community step up to kind of self-organize around this. About 10 plus people with Community Justice Project led by Greg Bloom and Alana Greer here in South Florida decided to work on mobilizing a team through Trello, through GitHub to build a solution around this. And this is a web solution called evictionprotection.org. Second slide. So if you go on evictionprotection.org right now, um, it sends you directly to a subdomain called florida.evictionprotection.org. And on the website, you can check your location to see if you're in, if you're in the state of Florida, if you're in a place um, and what's your eviction policy looking like. Two main features that we baked into this was looking at the county level for what your um, eviction protection looks like in terms of can your landlord kick you out and what does that look like in terms of like time. Next slide. So this is the eviction uh, protection kind of like location feature where we use Google Maps to dump a data set of about 10,000 properties here in Florida that have um, eviction protection. And in the um, search column, you can type in your uh, location and it will kind of like pop up and show you if this is actually a place that's protected or not. And we did this because a lot of people didn't have information on if they were protected. A lot of this information from our user research landlords weren't telling people that, hey, this is a protected place. So this was kind of like a tool to be, become kind of more accessible and help more people understand what's going on. Next slide. Um, the first feature we built into this um, was being able to check at your county level for what the eviction policy is. So you can put in your zip code and it will route you to, based on the 67 counties here in Florida, what your eviction um, status is, is it active, is it suspended, and what are cases that are active and what are the tenant kind of like removal uh, details. So in our first like month of launching this website in our first feature, we saw about 5,000 website visitors and the, uh, in the second month we saw an uptick of that. Um, and part of our work was understanding, okay, we've released this tool. It's doing a lot of intended good work, but what can we do to scale it? And part of that big question was understanding that we could release a piece of the feature and how we built it on GitHub so other people can kind of like take some of those same methodologies. So that's exactly what we did. We decided to release it on GitHub through Code for Self. Next slide. So this is all up. Um, and a part of that work of open sourcing the, the code is also understanding like the data sets. So we also made that available of how we took that 10,000 properties and made it available as well as we're using Google Analytics to kind of measure that on the website. And we left room enough on the website to be able to replicate it and bring it to um, state to state. So there's definitely room on the current website to build your own eviction protection if you're in a state and you want to make that like knowledge available to your to the people you serve. Next slide. So a big question I get about this project is like, what, what is the goal? Like the big goal is like change can only happen if it happens through state policy. And that needs to be in place to protect people at the local level through local government where people just, there doesn't, this website shouldn't have to exist. This should be already a service we believe that local government kind of offer. And part of the kind of like 
thinking from this from a user perspective while we were building this is people ask as we build this for just like renters um is it political because we're not picking a side and when you think about kind of like mass layoffs and the fact that people can't pay their evictions so mass layoffs and now mass evictions potentially happening we think it's um not it is political in a way to say hey we need to step up for renters but as a, polit um, a public interest technology group an organization that is supposed to be helping community we think it's also in our kind of like neighborhood and ballpark to say hey let's stand up for this and let's make sure that we can kind of leverage our tools to help as many people as possible so our hope is that with this tool would it need to be needed um, further but there is definitely things that can be improved on and currently with our website and um feature tool. So you can kind of go to GitHub and get a little taste of our like roadmap. And if you're interested in kind of like seeing the code and answering more questions, you can reach out to us at team at coforsouth.com. I think that should be in the next slide. Oh, no, it's okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gregory. Um, and now we are going to hop into sidewalk widths with Melly. Um, so Melly, I'll give you the floor. Great. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. My name is Melly Harvey. I'm a senior computational designer at Sidewalk Labs. Um, today I'm going to tell you about a project mapping New York City's sidewalk widths. Uh, this project uh, started as a result of Sidewalk Labs giving all of their employees Wednesday afternoons in order to donate their time um, to different causes around COVID-19. Um, and uh, so, so I use my, my Wednesday afternoon time to produce this project. Next slide. So when COVID-19 hit, the rules that govern public space turned upside down almost overnight. Um, all of a sudden, everyone became hyper aware of the qualities of public space that uh, make social distancing easy or difficult. Uh, next slide. And uh, one of these qualities is uh, the sidewalk widths. Um, and as you can see in these two images, Gold Street in the financial district has very narrow sidewalk widths, would be tough to maintain social distance on, whereas uh, Columbus Park in downtown Brooklyn has very wide paths. Um, and so I became very interested in uh, creating a map or somehow documenting these to both help residents uh, as well as inform decision makers about where street closures might be appropriate. Um, and so the, the difficulty with this was that um, there's tons of data sets for streets as they pertain to automobiles, uh, but very few as they pertain to pedestrians. So I did a quick search and, and there was no sidewalk widths data set. Um, next slide. Um, however, so um, I started this project as I start many projects, which was at uh, New York City's open data portal. Um, and I did find, even though there's no data set of sidewalk widths, there was one of the sidewalk outlines. And so my task in this project then became um, measuring the, the sidewalk widths uh, when they can be very complex shapes in many cases, as you can see in, in Central Park on the left of this image. Next slide. Uh, go back one, yes. Um, and so, go forward one. Okay, um, and so the solution I came up with was to uh, find the center lines of these, uh, of these polygons um, and then measure the distance from the center line back to the edge of the sidewalk polygon and double it and that gets you your sidewalk width. So next slide. Um, and I added uh, this data set to a Mapbox interactive map, and I uh, created a legend in, in order to um, show where uh, social distancing was either impossible, difficult, uh, somewhat easy, very easy, based on, based on a scale. Um, and that's what the colors represent. And so you can either zoom out and look at the city from afar and look at the, the patterns of widths across the city, or you can uh, zoom into your own, your own street or your own commute. Uh, in order to see uh, how the sidewalk widths might impact uh, you moving about the city. Next slide. Um, so then I put this up on GitHub. I made all the code open source. Next slide. 
Um, I posted about it on Twitter, and since I'm connected to the civic mapping community here in New York City, uh, it pretty quickly um, got, got spread around. Next slide. At first, people were very quick to tell me either um, how incorrect it was uh, or how, how exact it was. Um, and uh, I put a disclaimer on the map to, to say that um, I didn't ground truth any of the data, it's all from the public data set. So you can't expect accuracy or, or expect it to be a good way to, um, to make t safe decisions. Um, next slide. And I also got people that were giving lots of suggestions. So I made um, changes to the map based on uh, pe people's feedback. So for instance, putting the legend on the side um, for this one piece of feedback. Next slide. Um, and even more exciting, um, I started getting emails from uh, people in different uh, city departments. Uh, for instance, DOT was really interested in using the map to decide where to where to place outdoor furniture, and then uh, transportation alternatives uh, was, wanted to use the map for advocating for uh, open streets in New York City, which would close streets to um, to cars and then let them uh, be used by uh, pedestrians and cyclists during during the pandemic. Next slide. Um, and so eventually, the map uh, was. Um, made it to city council and it was used as in part as justification for passing the open streets uh, initiative in New York City um, or the open streets legislation which is expected to close 100 miles of streets to pedestrians over the next uh, couple months they've already started closing many streets and so it, uh, the map was was um, just a, a small part um, of the decision but it but it helped inform that decision uh, next slide But perhaps the, the most exciting part is that people have been copying the code uh, from GitHub and they've been making the map for many other cities around the world. So this is um, a handful of maps along with uh, the, uh, the, the people that um, reproduce them. And so um, I've been active in, in some cases, helping people uh, work through bugs and, and get these maps set up um, using GitHub as, as a way to collaborate. Next slide. Um, and so uh, I think my, I, I, I'm really happy that this has been used to make decisions around um, uh, the Open Streets Initiative. My, my biggest fear is that it's um, somehow enforcing the idea that urban density equals uh, disease, which it doesn't. We don't know the degree to which sidewalk widths impacts um, the spread of COVID. And, um, and I, I think we should be careful not to uh, make the, associ the association between urban density uh, and, and the spread of disease. Um, next slide. Uh, and this data set has many uses beyond uh, just informing uh, where social distancing is easier or difficult. Uh, things like placing street furniture or doing outdoor dining. Uh, accessibility is a really big potential use. Um, uh, looking at where trash accumulation becomes an issue. Um, also could aid in targeting public realm investment and where that's most needed. Uh, I think, but most importantly, I think this type of map is, in, is important because it spurs conversation about how we design and use our precious public space. Uh, sidewalks are something that not many people were thinking about before the pandemic and now they're all of a sudden top of mind. And you can see with uh, open streets that people are really open to completely um, rethinking how we how we manage um, and use our, our public space. Um, so I will conclude there. Awesome, um, great, thank you so much. That was awesome to see the process of that. Um, okay, cool, so this next one um, is, uh, I'm actually gonna present just um, a quick overview of some interesting facts about the New York City Police Department's budget. Um, I think that, um, you know, with COVID, we've seen incredible um, uncertainty and um, budget cuts um, across the city's budget. Um, and the city is set to make budget decisions and finalize their budget next week on June 30th. And um, 
there's a lot of uncertainty still to this day about where money is going, where it should go. Um, and sort of uh, even drawing from what Melly was just saying, um, how do we spend, how do we spend money? How do we you know, allocate space? How do we spend money? Um, one of the things Beta NYC is sort of, um, as, and the civic tech community is, at large is very, you know, interested in is making tools for more people to get involved with the decisions that are happening in government around them. Um, so since, um, since there's been COVID and there's also been all these calls to action around Black Lives Matter um, movements to defund the police, um, rightfully so, um, we thought we would just sort of um, begin a conversation because it's something I know we're interested in having. It's something I know I've spoken with Greg about um, and I know that they're working on a project to sort of look at participatory budgeting tools across the nation that um, we might uh, build together, or take models of and apply them here or something like that. So um, just quickly uh, from the Citizens Budget Commission, seven quick facts about the New York City Police Department's budget. Um, so about $11 billion from the city's budget um, are allocated to the New York City Police Department. Um, the city's annual budget um, for fiscal year 2020 was around 97, 98 um, billion dollars. Um, the New York City Police Department has the largest agency uh, budget, operating budget, um, so you can, uh, sorry, the third largest, um, so you can sort of see where they lie um, in the top 10 um, agencies. Um, most of the budget is spent on salaries and wages and uh, the largest share funds street patrol. Um, so, you know, I know I've seen a ton of police on the street even nowadays and one of my personal fears is that this becomes something that's normal. And um, I grew up in the city and so knowing the city even before 9-11 and what, what post 9-11 was like, um, it's kind of scary to think about what it might be like post COVID, post Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it's, yeah, so something to think about. Um, about one third of New York uh, Police Department employees are civilians. Um, so of those um, around 36,000 um, are uniformed employees and um, 17,000 are civilian employees. Um, in uh, the average pay for police officers was more than 90K um, and as high as 190K uh, for captains, including overtime. Um, salary data, um, we were just having a conversation, Anola and me, with someone, um, and she said her favorite data set was uh, city employee salary data, um, we, when we asked what their favorite data set was on the open um, data portal. Um, salary data is really interesting, um, and a lot of people don't know that they have access to it through the New York City open data portal, um, so this is just an interesting thing to note. Um, the NYPD budget um, has grown one-third since 2010. Um, and um, lastly, the headcount of the NYPD has grown um, by more than 3,000 employees since 2010. Um, so these are some, some fodder for um, us to sort of begin and further the dialogue, but beyond the dialogue, you know, how do we actually turn the things that we see um, around us, um, budget cuts, um, decisions being made, how do we take part in that? Um, I think the civic tech community here and all, and all over the world um, has a lot of interesting information, as you can see from the presentations today, um, and interesting skill sets and tools and processes for collectively creating tools that allow more people to engage with city budgets and um, create tools for, um, for participating in the decisions that people are making um, about where uh, resources are allocated um, in public services. Um, and we will point you to change the nypd.org um, um, where uh, it's Citizens United uh, for not justice, right, for police to, uh, reform. Um, they have a lot of great resources where you can learn more and take action. Um, and if you're interested or if you know any tools um, or uh, interesting projects uh, driven by a community of people that are taking place right now, um, I'd love to hear about them and perhaps uh, put together a beta talks around budget, city budgets um, in general. Uh, so that is that. And now we can start the Q&A. So just great job, everyone. That was really awesome. Um, Ooh. <laughs> uh, 
Um, thank you for sharing. Um, so the way this can work, um, there is a function on Google Slides. I've never used it before, but um, so I think we can stick to the chat. Um, I don't think there's been many questions yet, um, but I think we could get started. I bet you know has a question. <laughs> um, and I think there was a question. All right, so, so how we're gonna do questions is, um, at the bottom of your screen, if you're using the Zoom app, which it looks like just about all of you are, or if you're connected through um, your mobile device, you'll want to pull up the participants window, and that will enable you to raise your hand. Um, and um, this is a core function of Zoom and WebEx. So if you're attending a community board meeting, uh, whether it's in Manhattan or anywhere else, um, they take questions using this function. And we just want to teach you how to do it. Um, so that way you know how to raise your hand using WebEx or Zoom. Um, so um, all you have to do is click on your name um, and then you'll see a little more and they'll say raise hand um, and you can raise your hand and this is how we'll call on you. If you want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, uh, bring your video up, um, you're more than welcome to do so. So um, uh, if you wanna just type in the comments uh, or um, in the chat and ask a question, you can do that as well. So who's got, who's got some questions? Okay. Um, well, I will start off then. I will start throwing some softballs um, and I mean soft ones. Um, so um, Melly, what do you think, um, the lasting impact will be around a conversation around sidewalks. Um, so I think it'll be um, not, not just as a result of this map, but there's been uh, just a, um, increased awareness about our public space and uh, in and, and cities uh, managing public space to help pedestrians and cyclists have become all of a sudden more important than uh, cars, at least certainly in the period where there was a, a lull in traffic. Uh, and there's um, just a, a ton of discussion around how we use our public space and, and a lot of attention being put towards pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and I hope that both this map, but also all the other, all the other uh, copies of it that are for cities around the world um, are going to play into that discussion going forward. Great. Uh, uh, Rachel, I see you have a question. Yeah. Oh, it worked. Um, cool. Mm -hmm. I had a question for Gregory. I was wondering, since you've made the kind of possible for different people to see if their properties are protected, is there a thought to do like a layer where you can also like get protection or get legal aid or some kind of linkages with legal aid providers or others who could help if someone finds that their landlord is still trying to evict them regardless of the protections? Like what's been the connection also with community um, organizations that serve in complementary ways? Yeah, sure. So Rachel, the pro the project that we did was in partnership with a group called Community Justice Project. They're a law firm actually. So they actually like can provide those services. And on the website, there's like other tools like norent.org that we highlight that they're doing. So there's definitely that thought. Um, for this project, I would say it was 100% like volunteer project. So it was completely ran and organized by the team. And there is thought about like adding more to it. We only got like about 20% of what we actually wanted to achieve on it. So there is a roadmap. Um, what we're thinking about at Code for South is about kind of this idea of grouping projects. There's so many projects and some of them have similar categories like housing, like we've done like three or four different housing projects. So grouping them in a fashion of uh, what we're calling kind of like impact practices. So we can kind of open up the learning so we can find more partners that would be interested in like taking the charge and adding services there. So. Right now, there isn't like a hard, like let's connect people to like legal resources, but that is something that is like on like our roadmap of something we'd like to do. Awesome, thanks. Um, I have a question for, for uh, Z, who um, was working with, um, with Paul and Laura on the um, What's Open Map. Um, Z, I know that you did a lot of the technical um, 
things in the background. So I'm just curious, uh, what were some of the big technical challenges um, in the beginning and what are the technical challenges now? Uh, I guess the technical challenges in the beginning was looking for like an awesome data set to, to, to start using. Um, like originally we really thought about just importing Yelp data and, and Google data, which was, which was originally like really terrible. Um, and then using that as a base to kind of build up and then having communities input. When, uh, when, when Paul came to me first with, with the East Village data set, it was really awesome. Like they, they had most of the fields filled in and they really like initially even set a standard for how we kind of organize our, our data table currently today. Um, and now um, I think the real challenge is trying to meet the community, community's needs as um, we start reopening, um, maybe including more sidewalk with um, data, data sets or anything helpful to kind of um, like allow community members to kind of know like if there's a sidewalk cafe or if there's going to be possible um, possibility of opening a sidewalk cafe in that area. Cool. Well, I know I know who's collecting all those pictures. If you have a picture of a sidewalk uh, curbside dining uh, establishment, please uh, send it Noel's way. He is uh, creating a whole photo album book of them for his future grandchildren. Um, <laughs> um, jokes, uh, kind of, but um, he is collecting them. Uh, so, yeah, what else? Who else has a question? I see no hands. All right. Well, then let's go with um, one last question for each presenter, which is what's your favorite open data set? Uh, we'll start with, I'll start, I'll start with Z since <laughs> you've probably had a little more time to think about it. Um, I, I really like the, the pet names. Um, this was first introduced by Zachary, but yeah, it's been, it's been growing on me. Um, just there's so many um, just various and random pet names. Um, yeah. Cool. Melly, do you have a favorite data set, open data set? Um, yeah, my favorite is the Pluto data set. It's the one that uh, I've used the most, and there's so many things you can do with it. It's, um, and for those of you who don't know, Pluto. Uh, I, I forget what it stands for, but it's um, New York City's tax lot data set. So it has um, every every lot or parcel in New York City and uh, 40, 40 fields of data associated with it. Cool. Uh, Paul, do you have a favorite open data set? Um, I'm new to the world of data open and closed, but the New York Public Library has like a, a photos and that are on a map so you can like click on a corner in the city and it'll show you photos of from that and what that what that corner looked like uh i guess that kind of counts or maybe it's not open because it's near public library but uh open enough for for me yeah yeah i think i think that is um greg do you have a favorite data set from miami yeah. or anywhere Yes, uh, my favorite data set is the city of Miami's. Um, they have an open data set around building permits. And it's one of my favorites because um, we were able to do a partnership with DataKind and bring like 10 or 12 like data science practitioners to the table and sit down with this team at city of Miami who actually kind of like gave them like tips on what things they could do with the data set. And we were able to build something really interesting with it. So for me, that was kind of our first like big data set where we were able to actually do something. And uh, that's why it's my favorite. Cool. Um, does anybody else have a favorite data set that they would like to share in the audience? <laughs> if so, come on and unmute. No. Uh, yeah, so I think the squirrel census data set is a really amazing data set. Um, it's a census of squirrels in Central Park. Um, and w I didn't know that we had three different types of squirrels in New York. They're all related to the gray squirrel, uh, but we have black squirrels, we have red squirrels and we have gray squirrels. Um, and you can find out where they live um, using the squirrel census data set. Dog names is also a cool one. Also, there's like a, a tree one where it tells you where, what kind of tree is on what block in the city in New York. I helped build that data set. Yeah, uh, one, <laughs> two, tree. Um, we did a whole hackathon about it. Um, I got to hug all of the trees uh, that are outside of my window while measuring their distance from the imaginary intersection point on the sidewalk. Well, thank you for your service. <laughs> uh, 
um, that was going to be um, mine. Um, I'll also add that I love the bicycle, um, the bicycle data, um, the trackers and bridges, and also the infrastructure. Um, so, um, yeah, someone. Melly has her name, her hand up. If you oh. still have. Uh, yeah, I, I had another. I had a question for the other presenters as well, which is. Um, I, I worked for Live XYZ, which is a company that tracked um, uh, businesses within New York City. And one of the biggest challenges was um, tracking them over time. And that's where some of the most valuable information comes for analytics. Uh, I'm curious for, for the other presenters if they're tracking through time, if that's something they, they plan to do, um, and if there's there are any challenges there. Uh, I think that that's probably some, it's more Laura's headspace. Uh, and we looked at, at Live XYZ and, and we're thinking about reaching out uh, to partner with them on this uh, because of how rich that data set was. But the right now we are, we're doing the opposite of that and destroying each record and updating it each time it happens. But I, I, I will definitely mention to her that in at least her database personally for or the organization for the guide that, that there could be a, a collection of that. Uh, it would be interesting for this, at least for the city to know what kinds of businesses have X amount of sh life, shelf life. Yep, yeah. Paul, um, we actually have the data set like being archived on GitHub. So you need Never mind. social data from, from a month ago, but all the data on Google Sheets stuff is, has been overridden. So it's kind of sad, but any, any data ongoing now is, is being saved. So. Mm -hmm. No, that's the small businesses. I know that um, the MBPO is doing some small business um, data uh, collection, correct? No? Yeah, so as part of the mayor's task force on recovery, uh, the mayor's office of data analytics um, has been requesting community data sets uh, to go to city data analysts um, to be in a kind of like a, um, a community library for um, uh, for city analysts to kind of understand and see um, how things are are developing or recovering, um, and all of the projects that we have been working with, uh, what's open Queens, uh, essentially North Brooklyn, East Village, um, as well as um, Uptown Grand Central, um, we're essentially some stripping out the personal identifiable information and sending that off to the city so that way they can see who are the small businesses um, and help build their better understanding. Um, because right now the city is just really overwhelmed with understanding what are the small businesses that are, are coming back to life. Yeah, um, so just on that note, um, it's seven about seven o'clock. Um, so I'm going to ask, uh, first of all, I'm gonna say, Great, awesome work. Um, it's really cool to see how we're like actually like living in an age where decentralized community grassroots is like valuable and really useful and um, is leading the way. Uh, so really kudos to all of you. Um, there's so many important issues to be tackling right now and um, it's really awesome to see how these all sort of come together. Um, so thank you so much for presenting um, and uh, Right now, I guess uh, I'll just quickly leave a little bit of space. First of all, it's seven, so if anyone wants to clap for um, your healthcare workers and first responders, a little uh, awesomeness to spread. Um, so everyone's wherever everyone is. Um, and then if anyone has any uh, job announcements, upcoming events, um, community resources, uh, we like to just end with a sort of space for others to share um, opportunities or things that they would like to share. So feel free to unmute yourself. I don't think anyone's jumping and talking over each other. So Greg, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely coforsouth.com slash job. We're hiring. We're looking for a lot of people. We're working on projects to deploy. We've deployed air monitoring sensors all across the city of Miami and Miami-Dade County. We're working with a bunch of interesting data sets. We're doing a lot of stuff. So we're looking to hire part-time contract full-time. So check it out. Cool. Yeah. Check out their air. Um, I know some of us are really into air quality, um, myself included. So it's a really cool project and it's actually very pretty as well. Um, the leaf that they've designed to monitor air in different places. 
Anyone else want to share events, uh, upcoming presentations, or projects that they're working on? All right. Cool. Did someone unmute on purpose? No. OK. Cool. Well, then, um, thank you, um, everyone, for sticking around. Um, and we hope to see you next time. Um, Noel, do you have any final things to add, or Z? Nope. nope. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Uh, yeah. Wear your mask and uh, soak up that sun. And keep up the can. fight. <laughs> um, keep keep uh, pushing, doing whatever you're doing for the things yeah. that matter right now. Uh, FYI, protesting does work. Uh, call your city council member. Yes. The budget has yet to be finally negotiated, so you have a huge you have a huge opportunity to actually influence what gets funded. Um, so, yeah, uh, actually, uh, I will send, um, the, li I'll put the link to the slides if anyone wants it. I'm just confirming with presenters. Is it okay to share your slides, um, with everyone? Okay. I'm going to put the link in if anyone wants to see the last link that I, uh, sent to you all, or actually I can just email it to you. Maybe that makes more sense. I'll do both. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, and talk to you all soon. I wish I had some exit music. <laughs> <laughs>